This is Forgotten Wars. The Boers, the subject of this season. The British describe these white South Africans as backward and barbaric. Why, you may ask? Propaganda. The British were trying to dehumanize the Boers as tensions mounted before the Second Boer War. And as the war dragged on far longer than the British had expected, as history and life experience have taught us before, it's a lot easier to fight against those we dehumanize. Leaders have played on this for all human history. The less human you can paint your enemy, the more blind and deaf your followers are likely to be to your enemy's suffering, even if your enemy includes unarmed women and children. Why do the British paint the Boers as backward and barbaric? Because some of Boer practices and customs looked very backward. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence. Long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. When Boers and African tribesmen weren't trying to kill each other, they were often trying to kill lions, elephants, or rhinoceros. The following is the harrowing account of a 20-year-old Boer hunter. What happened on this hunt in 1845 changed the course of South African history. After about an hour's ride, I came across a rhinoceros and shot at it. But I only succeeded in wounding the animal, and it fled into the wood. I dismounted quickly, ready to shoot again, but moved only a few steps away from my horse, lest the rhinoceros should turn to attack me, in which case it would be necessary to remount at once. I succeeded in getting a second shot, but at that very moment, my rifle exploded just where I held it with my left hand, and my left thumb, the lock, and the ramrod lay before me on the ground and the barrel of the gun behind me. I had no time to think, for the furious animal was almost upon me, so I jumped on my horse and galloped away as fast as I could with the rhinoceros in fierce pursuit until we came to the ford of a little spruit when my pursuer came to the ground and so allowed me to ride quietly in the direction of our wagons. During the next day, our people, guided by the track of my horse, went to the spot, and there they found the rhinoceros still alive and, following the trail of blood, discovered the remains of the rifle and my thumb. My hand was in a horrible state. The great veins were torn asunder and the muscles lay exposed. The flesh was hanging in strips. I bled like a slaughtered calf. I had succeeded in tying a large pocket handkerchief round the wound while riding. When I got to the wagons, my wife and sister-in-law were sitting by the fire, and I went up to them laughing so as not to frighten them. My sister-in-law pointed to my hand, which looked like a great piece of raw meat. I called out to my wife to go to the wagon and fetch some turpentine. Then I asked my sister-in-law to take off my bandolier, and she saw that my hand was torn and noticed how white I was, for I had hardly any blood left in my body. I kept on renewing the turpentine bandages, for turpentine is a good remedy to burn the veins up, as the Boers say, and thus to stop the bleeding. I sent my youngest brother to borrow as much turpentine as he could get from the nearest farm, which was about a half hour's ride away. Hermann Poitheater came over with his brother. The former got into the wagon, and when he saw the wound, cried out, That hand will never heal. It is an awful wound. He had to get down again as quickly as possible, for he was nigh fainting. But his brother said, possibly to comfort me, Nonsense. I have seen worse wounds than that. Get plenty of turpentine. We drove to the farm. Everyone there advised me to send for a doctor and have the hand amputated. But I positively refused to allow myself to be further mutilated of my own free will. The two joints of what was once my thumb had gone, but it appeared that it would be necessary to remove a piece of bone. I took my knife, intending to perform the operation, but they took it away from me. I got a hold of another a little later and cut across the ball of the thumb, removing as much as was necessary. The worst bleeding was over, but the operation was a very painful one. I had no means by me of deadening the pain, 
So I try to persuade myself that the hand on which I was performing this surgical operation belonged to somebody else, end quote. People dealt with far more tragedy during the 19th century than we do today, at least in one sense. Take one of the most modern empires of that century, the British. More than half of those who died in England and Wales in the mid-1800s died because of infections. This is a much higher rate than anywhere in the world today. England and Wales suffered infant mortality rates around 15% late into the 19th century, with at least one of its towns having to lose nearly 25% of their babies before they turned one. These statistics do not even include stillborn births. Born in 1825, Paul Creer was definitely a product of the 19th century. This future four-term president of the Transvaal was no stranger to death and tragedy. Just 17 years old in 1713, Jacob Creer arrived in Cape Town as a German employee of the Dutch East India Company. 100 years passed, as did Dutch control of the Cape Colony. On October 10, 1825, Caspar Creer would father Stephanus Johannes Polis Creer, known to us as Paul Creer. Paul was raised on hatred of the British. He was raised in a colony with a white population so scattered that his biographer, Prescott Holmes, wrote that, quote, each family had perforce to be an isolated unit, almost wholly out of touch with its neighbors. In former years, each farmer had been given as much land as he could walk across in half an hour, and consequently, most of the farms were three miles in diameter, their boundaries marked by heaps of stones, and only a very small portion of the land cultivated, end quote. Schools were practically unknown. Teachers typically were retired soldiers who were capable of barely any other work. Boer farmers would laughingly say that these retired soldiers, quote, must be fit to teach because they could do no other thing, end quote. Little wonder that children found it difficult to learn how to read. Paul Creer was barely able to write anything more than his name and could read nothing more than the Bible until he became the Transvaal's chief executive. Even as the Transvaal president, he could read little beyond some government papers. Young Paul grew up on a farm with many blacks whose destinies were gripped by Paul's father, Casper. On many given days, Paul would have seen slaves publicly whipped in Central Square for theft and other offenses. He would have seen placards reading like this, quote, a slave woman and her four children at Messrs. Joan and Cook sale on Saturday morning will be sold the slaves named as below stated. Amdoka, a female, 28 years old, housemaid. Matilda, a female, 14 years old, housemaid. Titus, a boy, 10 years old, apprentice to a tailor. John, 5 years old. August, 1 year and 3 months old. The two latter will be sold with their mother. End quote. The Cape Colony Dutch and English lived in constant danger to their lives. Farmers were armed to ward off wild animals who would try to attack their cattle. Until he was strong enough to handle a rifle, Boy Creer used a bow and arrow to help protect his father's cattle. Farmers also relied on rifles to protect against raids by enemy African tribes. Farmers on the frontier were particularly vulnerable to attacks. They lived simple, destitute lives, at least relative to many European counterparts. They made most of what they needed. They slept in their work clothes, often not changing clothes for weeks. Religion was a civilizing influence. Caspar Creer and his family attended a Dopper church, a part of the narrowest sect of the Dutch church in South Africa. It falls outside the scope of Forgotten Wars to give you a comprehensive understanding of differences between the Doppers and the established church of South Africa. Creer's biographer Prescott Holmes described the Doppers as distinguishing themselves through song. They would only sing psalms from the Bible. They wouldn't sing man-made hymns. Doppers also believed it wrong to follow changes in fashion. Dopper men stood apart with their large vests buttoned up to the chin, their short jackets, and their wide-brimmed hats. Holmes wrote, quote, To be a dopper meant to object to change of any sort in any way, to resist every reform, good or evil, simply because it was a reform, end quote. To be a dopper generally meant to look at the British and their Christianity, or perceived lack of, with skepticism. The Krieger family and Dutch farmers resented the British for a host of perceived, and some real, grievances. The straw that broke many Boers' patience dropped in 1833 when England demanded the emancipation of slaves. The British offered compensation to the Krieger and all slave-owning families, 
but the British made it impossible for all but a few slave owners to take hold of their compensation. The trickles of war farmers pushing into the north turned into a river. Hendrik Poitheater led an army of farmers, including Caspar Creer, with all their belongings away from South Africa's coast. Quote, flintlock on shoulder and whip in hand, unquote, 10-year-old Paul trekked with this group. Paul's father, Caspar, was a famous hunter who exemplified calm steadiness in the face of danger. One eyewitness recounted that when young Paul came unexpectedly upon a lion and fired an errant shot, quote, the animal rushed fiercely upon him. The father, who witnessed from a distance what had occurred, with all that coolness and confidence which those only who are accustomed to such encounters can command, came to his son's assistance. Approaching within a few yards of where the lion lay, growling over its victim, whom it seemed to press closer to the earth, as if fearful of losing its prey, he leveled his piece and fired. The ball passed through the animal's head. When it rolled over, and after a few struggles expired near the body of the young man, who, to the inexpressible joy of his parent, has sustained no serious injury. Unquote. Paul certainly did follow his father's footsteps. Even before Paul was a teenager, he could ride bareback or in a saddle at full speed. Now that alone may not be impressive. What is definitely impressive is that while riding full speed away from a pursuing angry buffalo, Paul could turn around and shoot the buffalo in the head with his rifle. As an old man, Paul recounted the following, quote, When I was a child, I had to look after the sheep and the cattle of my father. In those days, I killed such a great number of lions, elephants, buffaloes, and rhinoceroses that it is impossible for me to say the exact number I shot. I had to keep them away from the cattle, and I succeeded in doing so. End quote. Young Paul not only proved his bravery and skill against animal, he also proved his mettle against man. Just days after his 11th birthday, the Ndebele tried to annihilate Andres Poitheater's 50-wagon group of settlers, which included the Creers. The wagons were tied together in a circle. Bushes were stuffed between the wagons. Boar boys and men stood inside the circle, ready to fight the Ndebele and their spears. During this battle of Vegkop, young Paul and the Boer defenders fired their rifles into the waves of Ndebele attackers. Women loaded and sometimes even fired the rifles. The Boers survived. They celebrated with hymns of thanks to their god. This would not be the only time Paul was called on to resist attacks by native tribes. Later in life, Creer would recall at least 15 campaigns he went on against natives. One of those was a retaliatory campaign against natives who had killed Hermann Poitheater and his party. Poitheater had earned their enmity by stealing cattle and children. Paul Creer was a commandant, one of the commanders of the 500 boars that were mustered to attack the killers and their protectors. The natives were chased into some caves and besieged for 25 days. When the nephew of the murdered Poit Heater was standing at one of the cave entrances, he was shot through the neck and fell inside the cave. Creer rushed into the cave through a hail of bullets to bring the corpse to safety. This incident typified Creer's bravery in battle. He would often return from battle with bullet holes and spear holes in his clothes, but somehow would avoid mortal wounds. As the war trekkers ventured deeper into Africa, they were surrounded on all sides by well-armed native tribes that outnumbered the Boers a hundred to one. Many of these tribesmen raided war farms, carried off war cattle, and even mutilated the bodies of those wars that they murdered. However, the Boers were obviously not just on the defensive. Through their brand of Christianity's lenses, they viewed natives as Canaanites whom they, the Boers, a modern people of Israel, were meant to drive out or beat into submission. Creer and his people believed that the natives had no souls. One way for you to make Paul Creer angry was to claim that blacks were the spiritual equals of whites. He would yell, quote, they are not men. They are mere creatures. They have no more a soul than a monkey has, end quote. Scottish missionary to Africa, Robert Moffat's interaction with a Boer farmer he lodged with may best typify the Boer attitude towards natives. Moffat, the missionary, was asked to conduct a family worship service. Moffat asked where the native servants were and why they didn't worship with the family. The farmer scoffed, saying, quote, Go to the mountains and call the baboons if you want a congregation of that sort, or stop, I have it, my sons, call the dogs that lie in front of the door. They will do, end quote. The Boer attitudes towards blacks also manifested whenever the Boers could overpower peaceful native tribes. Holmes writes again that the Boers, quote, shot down the unarmed black men and carried off their women and children as slaves. They attacked missionaries who endeavored to protect the natives. And when the missionaries made representations to their governments, 
the Boers attempted by all manner of slander to ruin their characters, end quote. Many Boers had a special hatred for British missionary and explorer to Africa, Dr. David Livingston. Dr. Livingston wrote repeatedly about the cruelty shown by many Boers. The following is one of his accounts, quote, the Boers, 400 in number, were sent by Mr. Praetorius to attack the Bok Wines. Besides killing a number of adults, they carried off 200 of our school children into slavery. I can declare most positively that except in the way of refusing to throw obstacles in the way of English teachers, Sechele never offended the Boers by word or deed. They wished to divert the trade into their own hands. They also plundered my house and property, smashed all the bottles containing medicines, tore all the books in my library, and carried off or destroyed a large amount of property belonging to English gentlemen and traders. Of the women and children captured, many of the former will escape, but the latter are reduced to a state of hopeless slavery. They are sold and bought as slaves. And I have myself seen and conversed with such, taken from their tribes and living as slaves in the houses of the Boers." End quote. Sadly, Paul Krieger took part in this 1852 attack. Krieger was also known for using his blacks as cattle. If he ran short of cattle, he harnessed his blacks to the plow and literally whipped them into shape. Some natives decades later would brandish the scars they received from Paul Krieger's Shambwok. 1869 was one of the years that Paul Krieger lacked enough hands to gather his farm's harvest. So he rode over to the nearby native town of Bakatla and demanded the chief Kamanyani to send him some laborers. Kamanyani apologized for not being able to send any of his people, for the chief's people were also harvesting and would see their own crops spoil if they went to harvest Kriers. So, quote, Krier, in rage, jumped off his horse and with his shambwok lashed at the chief furiously. Several of the native witnesses rushed with uplifted sticks to kill the white man who had thus assaulted their chief in his own council yard. But Kamanyani, smarting as he was from the blows received, restrained them. That night, the whole tribe, some thousands in number, left their homes and their land and fled across the Limpopo River, taking refuge in Sichele's territory, for they feared if they stayed after what had occurred, they would be wiped out. The reporter of this account felt compelled to then qualify this account with the following statement, quote, It is not to be inferred from this example of the war method of treating natives that the president is or was a monster of cruelty. On the contrary, he has a most benevolent disposition where whites are concerned. He would stop on the road at any time, however much occupied by affairs of state, to dry the tears of a child." End quote. Now here is a tangent I cannot resist. Krieger's corporal punishment was not an aberration in a certain sense. Floggings, corporal punishment remained a part of South African life for over 100 years. Even in 1994, South Africa had laws on the books mandating the whipping of people under 21 for any crime and still allowed for those over 21 to be whipped for more serious offenses. Corporal punishment stayed, at least on the books, in Britain until 1948. At least those arsonists, violent criminals, and sex offenders had to stand and take their punishment, rather than taking their beating bound up on the ground like Kamanyani did. On a lighter note, some legends formed around Paul's character that sometimes reached a comical extent. They remind you of myths around other epic characters like Scottish freedom fighter William Wallace. One Creer legend reports that in an 800-yard race, Paul outran a man who was riding horseback. You heard that right. In another foot race against some indigenous Africans reported to be the fastest of their tribe, Creer raced for the grand prize of some heads of cattle. Young Creer raced so far ahead in this long, hilly run that he stopped for coffee at his father's house on the way to the finish line. His father almost flogged Paul for not carrying his rifle with him in the country. So he made Paul run with the rifle for the rest of the race. The natives tried in vain to catch up with him by throwing aside their shields, clubs, and body ornaments. The myth has young Creer win this foot race by so much that he has time to get into a glaring match with a lion he stumbled on by mistake. He still had time to fire at the lion and narrowly miss being pounced on by the lion before the lion retreated. Then, Creer finished the race still well ahead of his native competitors. The official historian of the Trans Fall even recorded that Creer was strong enough to seize a water buffalo by the horns and force the animal's head beneath river water long enough to drown the beast. At age 16, Paul Creer acquired two farms. 
at age 16, our larger-than-life figure married Miss Maria Duplessis. Less than four years later, Paul could do nothing to stop his wife from dying during childbirth. Paul lost both his wife and the child. Paul Creer married again to Miss Hasina Susana Frederica Wilhelmina Duplessis, his first wife's cousin. She bore him nine sons. Only three survived Paul Creer. She bore him seven daughters. Five of them survived Paul Creer. Creer could endure pain with the strongest of human beings. One day in his 40s, Creer was launched from his horse-drawn cart. He broke his leg, but he and his native employee had to push the cart upright again, immediately after Paul had broken his leg. Creer rode for 90 minutes of agony in the cart before he could reach medical attention. He writes in his memoir, quote, The jolting of the cart caused me terrible suffering and my broken leg compelled me to nine months of inactivity, during which time I only managed to crawl about on crutches. My left leg has ever since been a little shorter than the other, but it was hardly noticeable after a time, end quote. What won't surprise a lot of you is that you were hearing the voice of Paul Creer near the beginning of this episode when I shared the story of the 20-year-old hunter whose rifle blew off his thumb. What will surprise many of you is not that Creer survived, what will surprise you is the remedy Creer believes saved him. Creer continues this story in his memoir, quote, The wound healed very slowly. The women sprinkled finely powdered sugar on it, and from time to time I had to remove the dead flesh with my pocket knife. But gangrene set in after all. Different remedies were employed, but all seemed useless, for the black marks rose as far as the shoulder. Then they killed a goat, took out the stomach, and cut it open. I put my hand into it, while it was still warm. The boar remedy succeeded, for when it came to the turn of the second goad, my hand was already easier and the danger less. The wound took over six months to heal, and before it was quite cured, I was out hunting again. I account for the healing power of this remedy by the fact that the goats usually graze near the Speckbaum River, where all sorts of herbs grow in abundance. Stephanus Ioannis Polis Creer would become a millionaire and president of the Transvaal. His children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren were rumored to number 200 by 1900. Even with his posterity, position, and prestige, Creer still kept the rhythms of a farmer, rising before six each morning, drinking an early bowl of coffee, and smoking a big pipe on the veranda of his house while receiving many visitors. You will hear more about Paul Creer than maybe any other character in our true story of these war wars, wars that have changed the lives of many, but have been forgotten by many more.